Who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star, lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe. How hopeless. And it's not a new question. The psalmist asked thousands of years ago, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars and the planets and the galaxies and the whole universe that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them and mortals that you care for them? Well, there's some answers right there in that psalm. We've been made a little lower than God, we've been crowned with glory and honor, and we've been given dominion over this planet uh, to care for this planet. So we do have a significant place in the cosmos. We're bearing God's image, and we're declared very good by him. Another psalm says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He's removed our sins to the very ends of the universe. The vastness of the universe is not supposed to teach us that God is absent or that we're insignificant, but that God's love is even more vast. So regardless of how God created our bodies, he commissioned us to bear his image. And regardless of how tiny we are compared to the universe, he loves us deeply. He loves us so much that God himself, the ruler of the galaxies, did not cling to the heights of heaven, but took on our very flesh. He came as a tiny baby. How much more approachable could the God of the universe become? Whatever our debates over origins, we know that Jesus came to be with us, to share our suffering, to bear our sin, and to redeem us to himself. The good news, the best news, is that our creator is also our redeemer. Thank you. Come, stand up. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Lauren. There will be a follow-up discussion of these issues um, here in the auditorium after the presentation. It will be led by the Reverend Scott Jose of Calvin Theological Seminary. Those interested should gather in the mezzanine area. However, we do have about eight minutes right now for some questions. We have microphones in the aisle. If you would like to address a question to either Deborah or Lauren, maybe up there as well, um, please come to a microphone and then briefly, please, very briefly, state your question. And no speeches, please, uh, unless you're one of them, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in regards to uh, uh, the models of uh, ancestry uh, three, four, and five, uh, how do you guys deal with the problem of dealing with a literal atom, seeing as a, a literal atom is essential to the Christian faith, faith based on what Paul says in Romans that uh, through Adam we have all died and through Christ we are made alive again. Uh, how do we deal with uh, the fact that we have to deal with a literal atom and uh, that? So. Well, for a longer, uh, a longer answer, I'd refer you to the writings of, um, of uh, George Murphy, that's on your handout and that I referred to. He gives a much more eloquent to that. There certainly are theologians who say that the interpretation of Romans 5 implies there really must be a literal Adam, but there are other theologians um, who make the argument that that's not necessary, that we can certainly believe that all humans are sinners and that uh, Christ is the answer to that without needing Adam to be literally the ancestor of all human beings and uh, go to George Murphy's writings for more on that. Thank you, um, good question. Yeah, and also um, in Romans 5, it talks about Christ as our representative. And so some people say, well, you can see Adam then as also our representative, and that's what's being talked about in those views three and four. Yeah. Hi, um, it would seem that death and the pain associated with dying um, actually causes uh, creatures and humans uh, intense mental anguish. How do we reconcile with uh, those who say that uh, pain and anguish seem to point to a cruel God or that evolution is the antithesis to a compassionate God? Um, well, uh, first, uh, we can look at these passages that talk about um, death and we can ask, first of all, on animal death, um, there have always been debates among theologians going back 
centuries, uh, whether animal death is a result of human sin. And since there have been these debates back and forth, um, and Scripture itself isn't resolving the issue, I think we can turn to the natural world and, and find out, well, because there's a long history, there really must have been death, um, uh, at least animal death, before the human fall into sin. Um, for some thoughts on pain, I would like to direct you to Philip Yancey, uh, an author who's written about pain quite eloquently. Um, and uh, evolution isn't just about uh, combat and death and struggle. It's equally about long lives, about uh, flourishing in an environment in which, uh, in which you are well adapted, about uh, having offspring. Um, yes, there are moments of pain and death, and yes, those are hurtful, but, you know, pain serves uh, in, in the intermediate time for most of your life. Pain t uh, offers a very useful function of alerting you to when you're beginning to be injured and you need to draw away. So that's a very brief answer, and again, Philip Yancey for more. Good question. Uh, yeah, you're next. I'm wondering about the uh, hypothesis of mitochondrial Eve. Is that still in favor, or has that fallen in disfavor? Uh, yeah, there's a mitochondrial Eve and the Adam correspondence. Uh, Y-chromosome Adam. Y-chromosome Adam. And so those can be traced back to an individual whose uh, DNA is in all of us. But it, it doesn't mean that that was the only individual alive at the time. There were other uh, individuals alive at the time also contributing. So it points back to a bottleneck of hundreds or thousands right. of individuals, not in a single one. It's tempting to identify that mitochondrial Eve with the Eve in, in Scripture, but it, that it, that's not how it works. Right. You have 46 chromosomes. You have lots and lots of genes. All of the genes in your mitochondria came from one woman about 100,000 years ago. All males, their Y chromosome genes came from one male about 60 or 70,000 years ago. But all those other 46 chromosomes... Um, the DNA came from other individuals alive at that bottleneck time. I think you're next. Um, when considering the uh, five scenarios of Adam and Eve, do uh, any of these um, scenarios take into account the flood? Like when you look at the flood, only Noah and his immediate family are alive afterwards, so it kind of resets the basis of humanity. Uh, can you expound on that a little? Not much. Uh, <laughs> no, other than to go to geologists. We'll say, go to the Bible no. Rocks in Time uh, yeah. by Steerly and Young, and they say a lot more about the flood. Right, so in the flood, um, the geologists, at the beginning of geology, all of the geologists assumed that the earth was about 10,000 years ago, years old, and that a flood greatly reshaped the rocks of the earth. And they looked for that. They didn't come with a bias against it, but a bias for it. And the evidence just is not there. Um, so the flood, uh, we believe, happened, but it was more local to a particular environment and not over the whole earth. Now, yes, if the flood was literally global and you're left with just the eight individuals in the ark, then we would be talking about descending from them instead. Mm -hmm. But if there was a recent global flood, it would appear in all those glacier layers, it would appear in all those sediment layers, and geologists have looked and looked and looked and not seen it. So uh, turn to the book by Christian geologists for a, a deeper to answer to that. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Well, um, it's the last one, I guess. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, not, not saying that, um, that uh, a non-literal interpretation of Genesis is wrong um, at all, but I was wondering if we could hear your opinion on where, where we would draw the line uh, as far as literal or non-literal, because if we apply, say, a non-literal interpretation to something also not seemingly scientific like the resurrection, we'd have some major issues. Yes, and that is a big concern. Uh, if we just go and say everything that doesn't sound scientific is, um, must not be literal, then we have a problem. So that's why we emphasize looking at the context of the, of the time. What was the original author thinking in the original audience? And the context of the gospel is it's a different genre, it's a different culture, and it's a different um, style of writing, and there's evidence right in it that they viewed this as laying down here's what happened in what order and what people said and what happened. Whereas in Genesis 1, it's much more of a flavor of a carefully constructed more poetic-like environment, and then has all those cultural things as well. So it's because of those differences that we can say that the resurrection was literal and Genesis was not. It's not a science driving it. It's those interpretations. Right. So we don't use our science to decide that question. We use the insights of Bible scholars like Professor Harlow to help us answer that question.
My favorite answer today, though, was Lauren's technical scientific